There we go. All right. Okay, so if we're gonna draw the Lewis structure for SO2, gotta first have its actual amount of electrons. So six balance electrons for sulfur, 12 total for the oxygens, 18, right? Yeah. Okay. So which atom should go in the center? Sulfur. Sulfur. Okay. Let's put our oxygens out as terminal atoms. Let's do basic connectivity, just to link stuff together. We have spent a total of four electrons. So we've got 14 remaining. Next general rule of thumb, start placing electrons that you have remaining. And we placed, oops, that wasn't a long pair there. So two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. 12. We have two electrons left. Where can those two electrons go? On the sulfur. On the, the sulfur. sulfur won't have octet. Yeah, the sulfur does not have an octet yet, so the sulfur can definitely handle those. Okay, so we've got ourselves a Lewis structure, but if it's going to be the right Lewis structure, we need to make sure that it is actually got proper formal charges and that everything has an octet. So quick glance at this, the sulfur, does it have a full octet? No. Nope. So let's use one of our lone pairs to make another bond, giving us, oops, it's not the letter I meant to draw. There we go. So that double bond we just formed came from one of those lone pairs around the oxygen. So oxygen still has eight. The, the oxygen on the right still has eight. The sulfur now has... Oh, eight. Eight, yep. And then the oxygen on the left has eight. But we need to check out that formal charge. So... Let's call this oxygen number one. Let's call this oxygen number two and sulfur, sulfur. So formal charge on oxygen number one. Off periodic table, six is the uh, period it's in, group it's in. So six minus, we have how many electrons around that oxygen there are in oxygen one? Seven. Seven. So we've got an overall formal charge of negative one. Yeah, it's not great. Formal charge on oxygen two. Well, six minus six, zero. Because each bond only counts for one. So the formal charge of zero is pretty good. That's a nice thing to have. Formal charge on the sulfur, six. And then we have five. But five, six minus five means a plus one. So our sulfur has a plus one and that's right next to the oxygen that has a negative one. That's a combination for uh, unhappy things. Um, you want to try to not do that if at all possible. Is there a way where we can arrange the electrons that will still follow all of our electron placing rules, but will allow uh, us to get rid of all of our formal charges? If I'm, if I'm asking a leading question like that, there's a pretty good chance, right? Move a bond, or yeah, move a pair from oxygen one to a bond with sulfur. Yep. So then, if we end up, we we're gonna end up with an 
And now our oxygens are equivalent to one another, so our formal charge for our oxygens will be six minus six, zero, and for the sulfur, it's gonna be six minus six, and that's gonna be zero as well. So this structure is going to be our preferred structure for our sulfur dioxide. Does that part make sense? Yes. Okay, well how can sulfur have more than eight electrons around it? Because doesn't it have more than eight now? Oh. Well, yeah. <laughs> There's something special about sulfur that lets it do that, though. What would that be? Check out where sulfur is on your periodic table. Okay. Periodic table. And then I really should just link one of these on my browser. Tell you what. Okay. Oh, that's the bad one. That's the bad one. Let's see here. What's going to work? What's going to work? This one works. Let's do it. Great. Okay. So here's sulfur, right? Enhance. Mm -hmm. It's right over here underneath our oxygen. So like right above my fat head. S sulfur is in row three. That means it's highest principal quantum number is N equals three. three. It, if N equals three, L can equal Zero, zero, one, or two. Yeah. And so if it can be zero, one, or two, we can have S, P, or D. Uh, D? Yeah, D orbitals. So sulfur can have D orbitals. That means sulfur can have an expanded octet. And because it can have an expanded octet, it can have up to 18 electrons around it because it has access to d orbitals where it can dump extra electrons into it. So that pair that's off of our sulfur right up here, that pair on the top can totally fit around the sulfur. Does that make sense? I mean, yeah, it's weird though. It is weird, yeah, but it's one of our rules. And it comes down to, again, if you look at that periodic table where, oh, finger cut off, there you go, right where sulfur is right up there. Because sulfur is right there, um, it, it's got access to empty D orbitals, so it's got space to accept extra electrons around it if necessary. And so with our Lewis structures, we take the thing up on that and we say, cool, you accept some more electrons then. So how does that help us though with your question? So we've got A molecule that looks like this. Well, if we go to the question sheet again, it asks, what's your electron geometry? And then molecular geometry. So what we're gonna have to do is count up our steric number. So we've got one region right there one region right there, one region right there. So our steric number is equal to three. So if our steric number is equal to three, that chart that you've got absolutely memorized. I know that's like, you know, you just rattle it off that the 50 states and their capitals, uh, 
everybody that you know, cell phone number, all those things that you have memorized these days. That three is gonna tell you for that electron geometry, your trigonal planar. Because the electron geometry is just based off of the steric number. Right. Molecular geometry is going to be your steric number based off of how many lone pairs you got versus bonding. One lone pair versus two bonding gives us. Bend. You remember? Bend. Yeah. Yep. Okay. And so now, question E, the one that we've all been waiting for. Question E is, is the molecule polar or nonpolar? Oops. Still oops. There we go. We got there. Okay. This is where we can do those dipole moments like we have on the slide. Is the oxygen or the sulfur going to be more electronegative? The uh, oxygen. Yeah, the oxygen is because the trend for electronegativity is that the uh, as you go down on the periodic table, you become less electronegative. So if you go up, you become more electronegative, and sulfur is below oxygen. So each one of these bonds has a bond dipole moment that is oriented in the direction that the red arrows are. When we add those arrows together using vector math, which I know is your favorite, we end up with the purple arrow. And the purple arrow is our overall molecular dipole moment. If you have a, mo a molecular dipole moment, are you a polar or nonpolar molecule? Polar. Polar molecule. Thus and therefore, polar. Huh. Does that, ma does okay. that make sense? Yes. Cool. So hybridization mm -hmm. what's the deal with, with that <laughs> yeah so i made um a video on hybridization but i fully recognize that it's an odd uh topic so the basic thing about hybridization is if you take a look at, well, okay, first, let's do this. If you have a molecule like CH4, right? That's methane. Draw out your Lewis structure. You have that. Steric number is four. Your electron geometry and your molecular geometry are going to be the same thing because we have no lone pairs. It's going to be tetrahedral. And so if you try to draw that out three-dimensionally, you're going to end up with something that looks like that. Right? Yeah. Okay. Each hydrogen can have a 1s orbital and the carbon is going to have for its valence orbitals 2s 
a 2px, 2py, 2pz. On one second here, kiddo is crying. And my, just gotta let my wife know. Okay, okay. So you've got a 2py, a 2px, 2py, 2bz. If I get out of the way, right up here, that's what those orbitals look like. How are you going to make those things look like the thing I've got drawn right here? How are you going to get those 109.5 degree bond angles out of this stuff having 90 degree, or I'm sorry, 180 degree stuff on an XYZ coordinate plane? Uh, motion them together? Smushing them together via hybridization. That's what hybridization is really all about. Oh. So with hybridization, you put all these things in that blender and they're really math. So like I'm saying you put them in a blender and these are the things that you pour out. Um, but really what these things are, are mathematical functions, right? And so if you add, um, mathematical functions together you get constructive and destructive interference um or you get constructive and destructive components of the equations the when you add all of this jazz together these things that pop out here are the resulting equations So this is all based off of mathematics that we're saying this works, but because we're not trying to teach you all three-dimensional calculus, we just kind of said like, it works. Okay. Does that make a little bit of sense about it? Yes. I mean, we're I'm totally straight up telling you we're just waving our hands at this point. We're saying, this works and trust me. And you're saying, I don't, I'm saying, cool, let's get out the calculus then. Cause that's what you end up having to do. And this whole jazz was really just, again, kind of, um, enunciating the point that when we're making bonds, um, like with Lewis structures, we're saying that the electrons are being shared from those valence orbitals. And so how do you get electrons into the valence orbitals with hybridization? And this is how you do it. You do promotion from, from the ground straight to the excited state of one of your electrons, as well as then afterward hybridize it. So okay. yeah, it, it totally is just kind of a little bit of boogity boogity boo. But um, and I've got that table readily available. Like if you go on to the support site and I think it's under this week for the weekly lesson, um, handout of the good table. This is where. You, if you want to for a general chemistry uh, one and realistically general chemistry two level of understanding, you can just memorize that the electron pair geometry, if you've got something linear, then that atom is also going to be in an sp2 hybridized state. So these hybridizations here are telling you what kind of orbital are involved in hybridization, how many of them. So like with trigonal bipyramidal here, you have your S, all of your P and one of your D orbitals all blending together.
because you didn't ask, I'll tell you. Um, that was supposed to be a joke. The There's actually a, um, a group of chemists that don't teach hybridization anymore um, because hybridization is not a great way necessarily of thinking about things that aren't um, carbon-based. So uh, like hybridization gets used a lot, utilized a fair amount to describe the uh, bonding structure, the kinds of interactions that you would expect around small atoms. So really stuff that's like uh, that first and second row of the periodic table. But when you get to metals, you don't really use hybridization to describe a metal anymore. Not like the way that it's written out here. So um, SP3, SP2, SP get used by organic chemists, but even some of them at this point in time aren't teaching this stuff and using it very much. It just, it's kind of um, an area of debate right now in the chemical community. The minority of people are the ones who are saying we should get rid of it, but. So what I'm hearing is I might not even have to know it. <laughs> you, what you're hearing is just go down this column of this table and you're good. Okay. If you know the stuff that's on this column of the table, you're set. You awesome. You do not need to be going crazy about the other stuff. Yeah, if you go to an organic chemistry course, like 95% of the organic chemistry courses taught in the United States, at least, are going to use hybridization to describe um, like uh, bonding around atoms because, because it is kind of helpful. Like you could say that's an SP2 hybridized carbon and so uh, in organic chemistry, you'd say, okay, if I've got an extra P orbital, then that's open for bonding. Well, then how does the orientation of another molecule that's trying to interact with that carbon have to come in in order to achieve bonding properly? So, I mean, it's a good nomenclature, um, but it... Kind of is it just a, I don't know. My opinion is kind of just a nomenclature. I understand where it's coming from. I get that it makes sense on small things, but once you get to bigger things, it breaks down fairly quickly. You definitely didn't ask about any of that. Um,. Here. Okay. So, another question. Mm, another is, question. Um, on NF three. Okay. Why is it? Why is its electron geometry tetrahedral? Mm, okay. And not trigonal pyramidal. Trigonal pyramidal? Yeah. Okay. So NF3. So um, periodic table, uh, 21, 26 electrons that we got to place. So if we do, we're doing speed version apparently, minus 6, 20. Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen, sixteen, eighteen, minus eighteen, two electrons left, twenty. Still good with me on the Lewis structure? Yeah. Okay. Steric number one, two, three, four. So steric number equals four. Electron geometry, it's going to be based off that steric number. So, tetra 
dihedral. Right. And that molecular geometry is going to be based off of um, the number of bonding regions versus lone pairs. So our molecular geometry will be trigonal pyramidal. That's what it will be. I don't know what the answer sheet says, but I don't know if that's what it's going to be. Okay. That, um, yeah, makes sense. I forget about the steric number thing. But yeah. yeah, the steric number is kind of the kind of a biggie, yeah. and like, because apparently I like the word like. Um, here, if we're in four, for our number of electron groups, our electron pair geometry, tetrahedral. You might say that the nitrogen is sp three hybridized. Your bond angles are not going to be 109.5 because that lone pair is going to kick those bonds where they're closer. So if we were actually going to do this and we were going to predict our bond angle, we would say that this is going to be less than 109.5 degrees because the angle here is going to be slightly oops, bigger than bigger than 109.5 degrees because the repulsion of a lone pair is going to be stronger than the repulsion of a bond. We go down here for the number of bonding regions. Three, one lone pair, chicken by bipyramidal. And it turns out that this thing looks almost identical to our ammonia. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. 